Okay, I think we're connected. Are we on live, Verla? All right then. So uh, let's go ahead this morning and and uh, start. You can keep your textbook handy, but I'm not sure if, how much we'll get into it, but that's okay. Um, we have some good stuff here. So let's pray and we'll begin. Father, we ask your blessing on the class this morning. We thank you for the Lord's Day and we thank you that we are able to continue on with your ministry and your church uh, in spite of all the restrictions. And so we ask your blessing on everyone that's listening this morning and will listen this week. And we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. All right, I don't think we have any uh, other announcements other than I still have one extra book here. If anybody needs one or whatever, let, let me know. Even if you're a distance away, we can, we can mail it to you. So um, what I wanted to do, you remember last time we, we talked about the uh, divided kingdom and how in about 922 or so BC, the, uh, the nation of Israel split. You know, Solomon died. He was the last king in the United Kingdom. And he died. And after some hassles, you end up with a northern kingdom of 10 tribes. And that's ruled over by a wicked, ungodly guy, uh, Jeroboam, in the north and sets up his capital at uh, Samaria. Then in the south, you've got two tribes, Judah, capital at Jerusalem, and Benjamin. So they're the southern kingdom. And you'll find in the Bible, the northern kingdom is referred to as Israel, and the southern kingdom is referred to as Judah. So you won't be able, you know, going through First and Second Kings and then even into Jeremiah and the prophets, if you don't understand that history line, you're going to be kind of confused, you know, how come there's two kings, how come it's talking about Israel sometimes, how come talking about Judah and, and, uh, and so forth. So um, it's interesting, as we, we saw last time, that the uh, um, kingdom of Solomon, which, which you tend to think of, you know, it's like the, the glorious high point of uh, Israel's earthly history here, right? The kingdom, you, you, you think that, and, and uh, but really the high point came under King David because Solomon, for all his earthly glory and building and expansion and wisdom and so forth, nevertheless, he uh, fell into, I didn't fall into it. He chose idolatry. Uh, disobeyed the Lord at, at many points, and all of that building and so on and glory put the nation into horrific debt. And so, and there, so there was a lot. And he used he used forced labor. I'm not sure that I remembered that from before, but but uh, he did, and and from his from his own people. So some of this stuff wasn't all that glorious to them. And and so when he died. There was a lot of discontent, and, uh, and Rehoboam, his son, who became the ruler in the southern kingdom at Jerusalem, uh, was basically a fool and, uh, because the people took their grievances to him after Solomon died and asked for some relief in the area of taxes and, and other things, and he basically told them to get lost. He said, if you think... If you think you've had a heavy yoke on your neck before, well, just wait until you see the, what I'm going to do. And, and so the, king, the, kingdom, the kingdom split. So that's where we're at. And that's why that chapter in the book uh, on page 309, you see it at the top there, a house divided, a house divided. Okay. And ultimately then, you know, the, the northern kingdom will be destroyed by the Assyrians in about 722 B.C., so for 200 years, 922 to 722, 200 years, there's these two kingdoms of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. The north in Israel, uh, northern kingdom of Israel never had one single godly king, not one. There were a few godly kings in the, uh, in, in the southern kingdom, including probably the most famous was King Josiah, 
who uh, 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 ruled at the time of Jeremiah. So his name comes up as we're studying through Jeremiah. But as we're going through all these details and facts and history, I, I want to uh, be sure that we all are, have the big picture or, or what you might wa want to call the master theme of the Bible. Because all of these details have to be related to the master theme of the Bible or you will not understand them uh, rightly. You won't be able to really interpret the Bible um, correctly and, 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 and you'll end up really with a, quite a superficial understanding. This is why people, uh, there's people who uh, regard themselves as quite pious and holy and eminent saints in churches and so on because they've got all kinds of verses and data uh, and facts memorized, okay? Um, and, and, but you know, so did the Pharisees. And uh, the Pharisees had probably, a, some of them had the Old Testament virtually memorized, but, but they didn't interpret and handle the Bible properly. And so all kinds of problems can, can come in. So we need to understand the big picture, the master theme of the, uh, of the Bible. The facts and the data are important. And memorizing scripture is a very, a very good thing, but you have to be able to understand what all of these things, uh, what, the, what the Lord really wants us to understand. For instance, if you go to uh, 1 Samuel 17, you have the account of David and Goliath. Now, that's one of the most well-known stories or history in the history of the Old Testament, David and, and Goliath. Most Sunday school curriculums will crank out lessons on 1 Samuel 17. And then, and, and you know how that stuff goes if you've ever been in classes that use the uh, curriculum mill produced stuff. Um, it always still amazes me that people actually get paid to, <clears throat> to write that stuff. But, you know, they'll, they'll give the account of the story of uh, David and Goliath. A lot of us grew up in churches like this when you're kids of Sunday school. And then basically uh, at the end, in the way of application, the students will be asked, uh, well, what does this story mean to you? You know, what does this mean to you? And different, um, different answers will be given to that um, to that question, you know. Some people will say, well, this is a picture of courage. David was very courageous. And that's true, but that's not the point of the whole, that's not the point that God wants us to, uh, wants us to get. Um, another one, it'll be more like, more allegorical. Well, there's, there's giants in our lives, okay? There's giants in our lives, and by faith, we can take the slingshot of faith and destroy those, those giants, okay? That has actually nothing to do with the account of David and Goliath as far as what the Lord wants us to, to get out of it. It is true that by faith and trust in the Lord and by the strength of his might, he, through us, can destroy, tear down fortresses, right, as Paul puts it in the New Testament. Um, but that's not the point of this, of, this, uh, of this account of David and Goliath. Um, another application that's fairly typical, well, we are not to trust in armor made by man, okay, and then they'll extrapolate on what they mean by, uh, by armor. But unless we relate 1 Samuel 17 then to the big picture of the Bible, um, which actually stretches then from Genesis to Revelation, then we are never going to get the real message that God wants us to have from the account of David and, and Goliath, okay? So I won't go into a lot of the, a lot of the details there, but but one of the things that God is showing us in that account, right, is that David, who is 
God's chosen king, David is a type, T-Y-P-E, he's a type, a symbol, okay, a picture of the son of David, the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how God in his covenant with his people um, through Christ will destroy the enemies of his people and his and his enemies as well you see this is the that's what the central picture is it's god working out the promises of his of his covenant for other reasons that we'll that we'll talk about then in a in a moment you see if you don't have an understanding of the master theme of the bible then all you're going to end up with, and this is, this is what, it's what I ended up with growing up in the church, this is what you're going to end up with, <clears throat> and it actually stands in a way, it hinders people from coming to faith in Christ, is that the Bible is just a hodgepodge of, it's, like, it's almost like a box, and people just threw stories into it, you know. And, uh, and so here's, but as far as connecting them, or and, and getting the, the big picture of, of unity in, uh, from, from the Bible, most people, most professing Christians, I really think they, they don't have that, okay? They don't, they don't have that. I remember uh, years ago, one time, my, my dad didn't talk about Christianity or the Bible or much hardly at all. He would, he would profess to be a Christian and we went to church, but... Um, he never talked to me uh, about the Lord at all, and and uh, so I don't. I still don't, I don't know whether he really knew the Lord or, or not. But <clears throat> um, I remember one time, and he and my mom had been going. For, they kind of went from church to church and whatever, and and then uh, they got a new pastor at one of the churches that they were at, and the guy was uh, just. Well, he wasn't a good pastor. He wasn't a good teacher. And, and I, I remember my dad saying one time, uh, he said, I don't understand why <clears throat> the preacher can't just start at the beginning of the Bible and go through to the end, right? See, and, and actually he had a good point there is I think that stuff really hindered my dad. Uh, that uh, he didn't, he was sensing that somebody needs to make sense of this, but it doesn't make sense to me then at, uh, at all. <clears throat> so let me give you a summary of God's main purpose. That is the master theme of the, of the Bible. And I want to give credit here to uh, G.K. Beale, B-E-A-L-E. You've heard me mention him before, <clears throat> that in his books on the field of study that's called biblical theology that has helped me um, a lot. And uh, some of his books we've got listed on, on the blog resource pages that you can, <clears throat> you can look up. But here's what the Bible's about. Here, I'll put this scripture up on the screen here. And it, by the way, if you, um, if you ask most people that profess to be Christians, what the Bible is about, what do they almost always say, right? Verla has her hand up. She knows. What do they almost say, always say is the big theme of the Bible? She didn't have her hand up. <laughs> okay. All right. That's okay. Um, <clears throat> She, I, she knows, but her mind is trying to run the camera. Jessica is not with us this morning, so we're having to we're having to fill in. Uh, but I'll tell you what the master theme of the Bible is. Mo, but most people will answer that question with, "Well, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus, right?" And that's true. But we need to know more than that. Right, we, you know, well, what about Jesus? Right, what, what about? Well, he, the Bible's about Jesus going to the cross and dying for our sins, 
so that everybody that believes in him can go to heaven and not go to hell and have their sins forgiven. And all of that, all of that is true, but um, it still is, it's still a part of God's big purpose. Why does God want to provide us a savior so that we can have our sins forgiven, right? Why does he? And, and then you could say, well, because he loves us. He does, he does, <clears throat> but he's also a God of perfect justice and he would have been perfectly just if he would have sent everybody to hell and not, not sent his son to the cross to die. There's still a, a bigger picture and it's right here. Look at, and not, this is just one place in the Bible that we see it. Start at verse 43, Exodus 29. There, this is he talking to Moses and the people in the wilderness about the tabernacle, okay? The tent of meeting, it's called. There I will meet with the people of Israel, and it, and, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. The Bible has an incredible master theme, and it is this. It is that our Creator, who doesn't need anything, He didn't need this universe, He didn't need us, but our, our Creator has resolved to not only create the universe and create humanity, but he has resolved that he desires to live with us, okay, and, and we, us with him. See, you see it there. I will dwell among the people of Israel. See, the tent of meeting was a place where he could meet, and you've got the pillar of cloud in the daytime and the pillar of fire at night. What is that? It's a presence of God with his, with his covenant people. Then um, Israel, and he reiterates it again in verse 46, I brought them out of the land of Egypt. Why? That I might dwell among them. That, that is the master theme of the Bible. Let's see if we can trace this through. That's why Christ had to go to the cross, because it's the only way that we could uh, ever live in the presence of God and, and, he, and, he with, and He with us. Think back to <clears throat> um, Genesis 3. Here we go. We'll go back again. Genesis 3, verse 8, okay? Now, this is after Adam and Eve sinned. Uh, but you can tell that this is, this is what was going on in Eden even before man sinned. Verse 8, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And of course, they, they hide themselves and, and so forth. Um, but here's God, you know, this imagery of him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Why? He wants to be with Adam and Eve. He wants, he wants, to, he wants to, to dwell with him. And what you have in Eden and what you have wherever God makes a place for man, his people, to meet with him, what you have is a temple, a temple. Think about it. Even idol temples that, that people wickedly build what is the purpose of building that temple? Well, it's, it's a house of their God, and they go there to meet their God and in some form make sacrifices and, and so on. But here, uh, then, Eden itself was a temple. It was the first temple. It was the meeting place where God would come and dwell with, and dwell with, his, um, with his people. Um, and so, of course, then because of sin, Adam and Eve are expelled from the temple. And that sets up then a repeated cycle in the, in the uh, scripture, which, 
which we're coming into a part of here as we see the kingdom of Israel and Judah divided. What, what is it? Well, they're going to be expelled from the temple. They're going to be expelled from the promised land and carried off into captivity, just as Adam and Eve were, because of sin, expelled then from the temple, which was Eden. So the cycle is creation. Okay, God, the first cycle was he created the universe. And he created, created man, Adam and Eve. Then in this cycle, there is sin. Adam and Eve sinned. They disobeyed God. Um, later, God will create again. He will create the nation Israel. He will create a people for himself. What will happen? They will sin. And like Adam and Eve, then there's judgment. There's expulsion from the temple. And then what? Well, <clears throat> there's redemption. Some kind of redemption at the end of that cycle. For Adam and Eve, um, it, it seems to be in the form of, you know, God making them animal skins to, to, to cover them as kind of a type of the, the blood of Christ or, or something, something like that. But also in chapter 3, verse 15, after they sin and they're being expelled, right? You have this promise. It's called sometimes the, the proto-evangel or the first gospel. I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So here is uh, God's word to the serpent. That's, that is the, really in ways the first mention of Christ in the, um, in the Bible. So, okay, so here is that, that cycle. It goes round and round again. Creation of Israel covenant terms that is the terms by which the covenant people can meet with god that he can dwell among them and they dwell with him and in that case it was uh under the old covenant of course it was the temp the tent of meeting and then the tabernacle ultimately the the temple that that solomon built but the law okay the covenant terms right if you will obey me, then I will bless you and I will dwell among you and you will dwell with me and you, I will be your God and you will be my people, right? Okay, what is going to happen? You know what's going to happen. Uh, sin, right? Sin, and then there's going to be expulsion, as we said. You see this uh, theme of God's desire to dwell among us again here in this is a really classic statement of it over in uh, Leviticus 26 here here we go verse 11 okay I will make my dwelling among you and my soul shall not abhor you and I will walk among you now, now see you got to be careful and think when you're when you're reading the Bible, you don't want to, or you miss you miss things. Okay, what does that phrase "I will walk among you" make you think of? Well, it makes you think of Eden, right? We, and so the Bible, another way of stating the master theme of the Bible is back to Eden, back to Eden. That's what's happening. Eden, Eden lost. In Genesis, and guess what? Go read the, fi the, the last half or so of the last book of the Bible, Revelation. And what are you going to find? You're going to find the tree of life. You're going to find the rivers. You're going to find you're going to find Eden restored. Okay, that that's why Christ went to the cross. That's what this thing. That's what this purpose of God is all about. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt that you should not be their slaves. I've broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk um, um, erect. So there it is, you know, creation, a temple, fellowship with God, terms for fellowship with God, 
breaking those terms, sin, and then there's expulsion, and then there is, and then there is redemption. So everything in the Bible relates to then that, that, um, that cycle, right? And uh, we don't have a lot of time to do that this morning, but you can really bring this theme home to us and right, and right where we live because then you can begin to understand. Um, well, let me back up, okay? We've said at this point, <clears throat> to this point, that every cycle of creation and temple and sin and expulsion and, and promise of redemption ends in expulsion. It ends in sin. It ends in failure, right? But there's something called the new covenant. And there's something, that, there's the gospel. There is there is Christ. And this time, this time in the new covenant and in the new temple, the people of God will never be expelled. The terms of the covenant are perfectly met, but they're perfectly met by Christ and uh, for us. And our sin is atoned for. And so this is vital for us all of us as Christians to know we're on our way back to Eden. So you come to the New Testament and what kind of language do you find? Who are you if you are a Christian? You are a new creation, right? Uh, who is Christ when he comes into the wor- this dark fallen world? He is the light and life of the world. He is, and uh, let's look at this point. This is where a proper understanding of Israel comes in, okay? Probably, I would say the majority of evangelical type Christian, Christians who believe, you know, you believe in Christ and you've got to be born again and that's all correct. But they've been taught a wrong understanding of Israel. And as a result, they really get robbed of, of uh, well, the fo- their focus is wrong, and they get robbed of, of what God really has done for us um, in Christ. So let's, let's spend a little bit of time here on this matter of a proper understanding of, of uh, Israel. Israel, the nation Israel, the Jews, Israel is not the end focus of eschatology. Now, eschatology is the study of, uh, you know, eschatos means last, and then logos on the end there is like we're last. It's, it's the study of, of prophetic scriptures and the end time. Really, what you have, in, you know, what are the last days in, in the Bible? They're now. It's the church age. The last days is not. It's not even something. It's not something just in the future. It's we are living in the, in the in the last days. Okay, so so Israel is not the focus of la, the what the Bible teaches us about last things. But think about it. How many um, <clears throat> how many millions of copies of books have been sold to Christians? that teach that it's all about Israel. It's, it's all about Israel. There are still lots of Christians today who, um, man, they keep up on the details of what's happening over there in the Middle East, and here's what's going on with Israel and, and the Jews. And, and, and this, is because, this is because they've been taught a wrong understanding of of the of the nation of the nation Israel and as a result they have a wrong idea about who they are as Christians and about what the church is okay what uh, what the the church is the um, I won't go into detail about this but the error of this wrong teaching on uh, Israel is 
is found in, in that system of theology we call dispensational theology, okay, dispensational theology. This is one of that, I actually, I grew up it being taught that. Um, I went to a Bible college that had its roots as a dispensational school, and uh, I still have at home, I have this big, kind of a remarkable book, an old book on dispensational truth by a guy named Clarence Larkin. It must have been back, like written back early 1900s, real early 1900s. And it was my grandfather's. And uh, it's got my grandfather's name in, in the beginning and it's got all these elaborate uh, diagrams and drawings and stuff that to illustrate this system of theology and, Israel and the Antichrist and 666 and, 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 and all kind. Anyway, anyway, it's a very, 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 very detailed. But so fundamentally, when people asked, what is the difference between reform theology and dispensational theology? The answer is we have a, we have a radically different understanding of who Israel is, or let me put it this way, we have a radically different understanding of who the people of God are and, uh, and of um, the church, of the, of the church, okay? Um, dispensationalism has historically, there are different brands of it, but it's even, it's even done things like teach that uh, there's a separate way of salvation for the Jews than there is for the Gentiles. Um, that God will um, ultimately, his, his real plan, his fundamental and most important plan is to make the physical nation of Israel and the Jews into the... the in a new Jerusalem on this earth, restore and restore them, okay, to their promised glory on this earth. And really what happens then is the church, which it gets a little foggy as to what their concept of the church is, but the church becomes kind of a side issue. And that the, God's real purpose was to deal with and restore the, the Jews, the nation Israel, and that the church and the salvation of the Gentiles is kind of a kind of an afterthought, kind of a, a second a second plan. Okay, so um, probably one of the most well known dispensationalists that that people know about today is John MacArthur, um, and uh, he will say I, I've heard him say at conferences before. Uh, my theology hasn't changed. He was trained by dispensationalists and so on. My theology hasn't changed from day one. My, everything, I, it's just absolutely the same. When the Bible uses the word Israel, it always means the Jews. All right? It, Israel always means the Jews. It never means any, anything else. Well, that's like so wrong that you can even try to make a, you wouldn't even be able to begin to, to um, uh, defend that statement. Let me give you a couple of examples here. If you look in, you know, so like, so who is Israel ultimately? And not just in the Old Testament, but who, who are the people of God that's always been the people of God ever since the Old Testament, all, all the way through. Who, who are the true people of God? Um, who, who, is, who is the church and who is it? Well, for instance, if you... Um, well, I've got a lot of verses floating around in my head here right now. I'll just start with one. If you look at Romans 2, for example, down at the end here, and you know... The Apostle Paul was the Apostle to the Gentiles. <clears throat> and he had to deal with Jewish false teaching and people wanting to go back to the law and so forth all the time. But verses 28 and 29, and check this out. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. 
nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly. And you might say there, and always has been. A Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, just those two verses right there tell us that um, to be a true Jew, and, and what does he mean here by Jew? He means a, 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 a child of God, a, a true uh, member of God's covenant community, all right, a true Jew, his, his people, who are they? Well, they are people who are, who are uh, uh, his children inwardly, and in other words, that language in verse 29, who have been born again, right? Who've been born again. So now check this out. If you go over to uh, chapter four of Romans here, <clears throat> look at this now. Okay, if you wanna talk about the Jews, talk about the Jew, the first one, Abraham, all right? What shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him, as Abraham did, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now look at verse 9. Is this blessing then? So here you have Abraham and you have David. They're blessed by God in the greatest sense. They're counted, they're reckoned to be righteous. They're reckoned to be righteous before God, okay? Now, how do you get that blessing? Is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Is it only for the Jews? Is that who the people of God are? Or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before. In other words, get this now, Abraham was a Gentile when he was saved, when he was justified. That's what that justification, that's what that language is. He was counted as righteous. He was a Gentile. And God purposely did it that way because, verse uh, 11, he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. So Abraham is uh, counted righteous, justified by faith alone back in Genesis 15. He's not circumcised until Genesis 17. So what you have here in Abraham is you got kind of a dual guy. He is a Gentile, and then he's a Jew, okay? And, and the reason here is that because God made these, this covenant with Abraham, and it was through Abraham's seed, you can read about that over in Galatians, seed with a capital S, the Lord Jesus, that, that, um, that Christ and all who are in him would be recipients of the promise made to Abraham, which includes justification and forgiveness and eternal life and the, and the, the, the promised land, which is the, the new heavens, and, uh, and the new earth. So now see, just some reasonably serious thinking about just these two passages I've showed you in, in Romans 2 and Romans 4 um, tells you 
that Israel, the true Israel, must, must be something more. It must be a body of people that is, is not just the physical, earthly nation of Israel, okay? It has to be, it has to be uh, something else. And there's all kinds of other passages in the Bible that, that show us then that this is the case. Um, let's see, which one of these verses shall I show you next? Um, well, okay, here's, take a look at Exodus, Exodus 19, okay? <clears throat> Verse 6. Here they are at Mount Sinai, okay? And God says to them, to Israel, to the Jews, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Now, I don't know if they have this in the cross-reference verses here or not. Um, yeah, here we go. Look at Revelation. Get on there. Where's my cursor? There we go. Revelation 1.6. Uh, I'll start in verse 4, actually. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. Now, who is John writing to? John is writing to Christians. He's writing to the seven churches in Asia, okay? Not writing to the Jews as such. He's writing to churches, all right? People who have been born again. People who have been freed from their sin by his blood. Now look at verse 6. And made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, so here's what happens. You start out in the Old Testament with this earthly nation of Israel, these earthly covenant people, you start out there, and God says that his, his uh, purpose for them is that they become a, a kingdom of, of, uh, of, of priests so that basically they can show the whole earth his, his glory. That's really what Adam and Eve were supposed to do, right? But, um, but of course, they all sinned, it didn't come about, but now in the new covenant in Christ, he is telling, the Lord is telling us, Christians, the church, that we are to be this king. He's, in fact, he's made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. So now he's addressing the church. And what you'll find, and there's, and there's example after example after example in the New Testament of this, you will find that in the, something that in the Old Testament applied to the nation Israel, in the New Testament now, it's applied to the church. And what this shows us is that the church, the, the, the true church, the true people of God, people who genuinely are in Christ, is the true Israel. And it always has been. See, um, even back in the Old Testament, you had people, you know, how did you get into the nation, into the nation of Israel? How did you become a Jew? Well, you were born into it by Jewish parents, you know, and then you were circumcised and they're okay that, um, that you're, um, you're, you're a Jew. But now this circumcision is of the heart. It's the, it's the new birth. So Jesus tells Nicodemus, you, you, must be, you must be born again. And he was, he was oblivious to this. Okay? So, so um, who, it goes back exactly to what Paul said there that we looked at in Romans 2. A true Jew is a person who's been circumcised in heart. That is, they've been born again. They've been born again. And you can find all kinds of pro promises of that new covenant back in the Old Testament. For instance, 
Let's go to Jeremiah 31. This is probably one of the classic ones, and there's another one over in Ezekiel. But check this out. Okay, so Jeremiah, here's these dark days. Nation of Judah is being wiped out. Northern nation's already been wiped out. Um, people are wicked, They're disobeying, disobeying the Lord, and evil. They won't listen to Jeremiah. They hate him and try to kill him. And, but here is this great prophecy of what God is, has accomplished in the Lord Jesus Christ. In this case, what he would accomplish, because this is way back in Jeremiah's day. Look at this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, even from our background that we've just looked at this morning, you immediately see, wait a minute here, this, this phrase, the house of Israel and the house of Judah, that's got to apply to something more than just the uh, physical Jews, physical nation of, of Israel here. Because, and he goes on, this new covenant will not be like the covenant that I made with their fathers, the Mosaic, the, the law, on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was a husband, their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant, by the way, that passage, I should write a blog article on that. See that last phrase, side note, verse 32. They broke the covenant. They were wicked. They broke the covenant, though I was their husband, right? Later on in Jeremiah, you find out God divorces them. It's, anyway, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. Now look at this. I will put my law within them, not on tablets of stone, but in them, and I will write it on their hearts. What is that? That's the new birth in, by faith in Christ. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. See, there's that theme again of I will dwell among them, and they will dwell with me. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord. You better know the Lord. Here's his law. You better obey it. No, they won't have to do that anymore. For they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. In this new covenant, how many people in the new covenant know the Lord? All of them. Everybody, you see. And, and uh, this, this is where, incidentally, there are still, it isn't just dispensational theologians that are still stuck back in the Old Testament with, but but some Reformed uh, people are as well. They have the idea that uh, their, their idea and their understanding of the church includes people who don't know the Lord. Okay? I won't elaborate on that, but you, that's something you can, you can check out, you see, is that there are people. How do you get to be a member of some reformed churches. How do, you, how do you do that? And the answer to that is, um, is that you, um, well, you need to somehow become a partaker of the covenant. And at that point, we have to ask, well, what covenant are you talking about? Because the new covenant, you got the old covenant and the new covenant. The old covenant if somebody was born to Jewish parents and circumcised, they're in, okay? They're in the covenant. In the new covenant, if someone has been circumcised, if they're in the new covenant, if they're, the God's law is written on their heart, they're born again, they know the Lord, all of them. So, so who are these people then who are said to be members of the church? but they don't know the Lord. They're, they're not converted, you see. So there, you, and you run into that, you still run into that. There are, let's see, we've got a few minutes left here. Um, let me see if I can find some more parallels here. Um, 
There are lots of examples in the book of Revelation where Old Testament verses that applied to the nation of Israel are now applied in, in their fullness to, to the church, which is then the, uh, the, true, um, the true Israel. Probably one of the biggest examples uh, of that is Jerusalem, okay? So here's Jerusalem in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant the capital of the people, the place where God dwelt, the place where the temple was and so forth. Jerusalem, the, the holy city. And there's all these Old Testament verses. You find lots of them probably, what, in Isaiah, where it's talking about the people of God going up to worship the Lord and, and it's talking about the end times. And, and, uh, and so here's Jerusalem, Jerusalem. And so there's this focus on uh, that people will have today on, it's all gonna happen at Jerusalem. Christ is gonna come back. He's gonna rule and his throne's gonna be in that city in Jerusalem. But you go to the book of Revelation toward the end, what is it? Chapter 20 to 22 or somewhere in there, that Jerusalem, the holy city is, is seen descending from above and it's like well what is this a picture of it? it it's not the earthly Jerusalem what is it well what it be what it the earthly Jerusalem always was and always was a type and a symbol of and pointed to was the true temple of the Lord the true uh, Jerusalem which is the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so that, that picture in Jerusalem, I mean in, in Revelation, is a picture of when Christ comes again and he, he, he renders final judgment and he brings in in its fullness, consummation, the new heavens and the, and the new earth. So that's, and, and that, that turns out to be Eden restored. I'll give you one final um, example of that. Think about the temple. Okay, we said that Eden was like the first temple, meeting place of God and man, where God would dwell among his people, the temple. Then there's sin and there's expulsion and so on. And uh, <clears throat> the next temple, basically, that you come across, there might be some more minor examples that I'm missing, but Basically, it's going to be then in the wilderness wanderings, building the tent of meeting and the tabernacle and so on. Okay, so you have that here where God dwelling among his people and it, that's ended by, by sin. And then uh, you have the building of uh, Solomon's temple and, uh, and, and you have all the sin that follows and and Ezekiel, these visions of the glory of God departing from that, from that temple. But there's always in the Bible, there's this progress of the temple, the temple, the temple. And when you come to <clears throat> uh, the opening of the New Testament, what have you got there? Well, you've got, you've got Herod's temple, the temple that Herod built there. And it's in Jerusalem, and the Jews think that, you know, this thing is never going to come to an end at all, and it did in, in 70 AD. But what happens? God, I'm probably going to overlapping into the sermon a little bit here today because I'm going to talk about Emmanuel. But um, <clears throat> Christ comes, and when Christ was here on earth, Right when he was here, where was the temple? It actually wasn't at Jerusalem. Jesus said, "Destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days." Well, he's talking. He's talking about his body. He was the temple. And think about it. He was Emmanuel, God with us. He was God dwelling among his people, and 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 we with him. All right. So he was the temple. Now, what happens when Christ ascended? back to heaven. What happened? Shortly thereafter, what have you got? You got Pentecost and, and uh, the Spirit comes. And so today, now 
in this transition period, you might say, before Christ comes again, what is the temple? And the answer is, if you're a Christian, you are. That's what this whole business about is about. Uh, you, you see what I mean? It's like people just get these details and, and they don't see the big picture. They're like, I'm a Christian. Jesus lives in my heart. When you're a kid, didn't you know that's what your parents, Sunday school teacher, and so on. Jesus lives in your heart. He lives in your heart. And that's great, but, uh, and it's true, but, but what's it all about? There, there's a more powerful message there. You are the temple of God. You are the temple. He, the Holy of Holies, you are the Holy of Holies. He is dwelling with you. Why? Because it is always God's purpose and desire to dwell with his people. Okay. Now, ultimately, then, and so the church is called, Ephesians 2, the church is, is like the temple under construction, you know, and you are the building block. But ultimately, when Christ comes again and comes, what's going to happen? Revelation says there won't be a temple. Well, what it means is there really will be a temple, but uh, the, it, it, there's no localized temple. The whole creation is a temple. Why? Because the whole creation is Eden restored, and, and there's uninterrupted uh, communion then with God. That is just an overview of the master theme of the Bible. Just remember this, it is God's desire to dwell with us and have us live with him. That is what it's all about. That's why Christ came. That's why there's a new covenant. And, uh, and, that's, and that's where we're headed, you see. Uh, well, let's stop right there and we'll plan next time for sure to pick up on page 309 and learn some more about this divided kingdom that's moving toward expulsion from, from, from the land. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that you set your love upon us and that you desire to dwell with us even though it required you to send Christ to the cross for us. And we pray, Father, that Christ would come again very soon and we would be with you in glory. We pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.